It's uh, great to finally be uh, right at the end of an amazing journey that we have been going on at, as a church. Uh, if you're visiting uh, tonight, uh, we've been working through the Bible over the last year. We've been working through the whole Bible and um, uh, in our specially prepared cover to cover program. And we're, we're coming to the end of that, aren't we? Uh, we've come coming to the last couple of weeks. And in this last couple of weeks, we're going to look at the book of Revelation. Now, who out there has braved through the book of Revelation? Anyone uh, had a look through that? Now, uh, unfortunately, most of what people popularly know, actually, you know, people, there's a lot of references in the book of Revelation that are familiar to many people, but mainly, unfortunately, from metal songs and zombie movies. Uh, well, I want to move uh, as far away from that as I possibly can, uh, but truly uh, the book of Revelation is filled with lots of strange, uh, weird and wonderful things, the red dragon, the number of the beast, uh, the, uh, the beast out of the sea, and, and uh, you know, the, it's all sorts of strange things, the number, it's just, uh, it's bizarre, numbers, figures, uh, symbols, all sorts of things. And what I want to do tonight, typical of this series, is to try to draw out a major theme in this. We're going to look at this big picture, and I'm going to attempt to tackle the whole book uh, tonight. Now, I'm going to look next week also at the book of Revelation. I'm going to focus mainly on the last few chapters. So I'm not going to give a lot, I'm not really going to give any detail. I'm just going to allude to the last few chapters, but not going to spend a lot of space on that. I'll look at that next week. The book of Revelation opens uh, with these words. The revelation, and the Greek word uh, there is the word apocalypse, apocalypto, the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart, who take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. Now, the word there, to take to heart, means to keep in view. It it's, comes from the Greek word to guard, to keep this in view. So it's saying, blessed are those who through everything that they do, keep this perspective. This book is an apocalypse, and in Greek means Re literally revealing, drawing back the curtain to show us a bigger perspective, and blessed is the one who will continually view their lives in the light of this bigger perspective. Well, boy, oh boy, is it a bigger perspective. So you prepare yourself for a roller coaster ride uh, tonight. Now, I'm going to work through this uh, fairly quickly tonight, and I've been told that I speak quite quickly anyway, uh, but I'm going to speak about twice as fast uh, tonight. So you'll need to uh, concentrate, but that's okay. You're all intelligent people, just as well. Uh, it, so it'll feel like a little bit of a lecture, but what I do want to try to draw out a main point out of this, because actually, this is a very, very practical book, and there are some very important practical things that come out of this, and I do want to highlight that. Interesting that the book is referred to as the book of Revelation, because when we come to the book itself, what we find is something that seems to conceal more than reveal. And if you've ever tried to read through the book of Revelation, you will immediately be confronted with a whole lot of very cryptic symbols, and probably really confused by a lot of those symbols. Now, there are a number of reasons why the book of Revelation uses symbols. It makes very strong use of symbols. Symbols, of course, are very common to, throughout the Bible, throughout the Tanakh, or the Old, Te Old Testament, as we know it as Christians. We, th there is strong use of symbols. And uh, this continues and in, a almost, in a more intense way in the book of Revelation. There are at least three reasons why symbols are important. First of all, these symbols are God's way of telling us something without really telling us anything. You see, this isn't soothsaying. This isn't mapping out the future so we know exactly what's going to happen. Aren't you glad that God doesn't tell you exactly what happens in the future? I mean, who would want to know that? But God does want us to know the nature, the character of our future. So he uses symbols to tell us something without really giving us information telling us what we need to know. The second reason why symbols are important is because symbols are a way of mediating to us things that are actually ineffable or inexpressible. There are many things that are described in this book that are inexpressible, visions of heaven that can't really be put into normal language and so 
Symbols are used to mediate this. And then thirdly, another interesting uh, reason why symbols are important is because they allow for possible multiple fulfillments. A symbol, as opposed to directly describing a certain event and naming the person and naming the place, symbols allow for events to reoccur and then culminate in one final event. So to give you uh, an example, many of the things described in the book of Revelation, such as the coming of the Antichrist, uh, the beast of chapter 13, took place actually in the first century under emperors like Nero and Caligula and others. In fact, the most probable original meaning behind the number of the beast, 666, according to ancient, the ancient practice of gematria, which is the practice of ascribing numerical value to letters. This was quite a common practice, and so names would have a certain number. There would be a number to your name. And uh, according to these calculations, the most probable meaning, and actually works out quite well for 666 is Nero Caesar. Works out perfectly. Now, I'm not going to uh, go into how that happens, honestly, because otherwise I'll be two hours uh, explaining that. But this doesn't mean that this prophecy is now therefore depleted. Nero then becomes a type of a greater antichrist who is yet to come. So these sort of types appear throughout history and then culminate in one final instance. Are you with me? So that's another important reason why symbols are actually important. So symbols have this multifaceted purpose. They tell us things without telling us too much. They mediate inexpressible things and they are flexible enough to allow for multiple uh, fulfillments. In fact, as I said, symbols are used throughout the Bible. So actually, all of the symbols that we are going to see in the book of Revelation are very common to the rest of the Bible. There's very little that's actually new of all of these symbols uh, in the book of Revelation. In fact, this is one of the significant things about this. This points to the fact that the book of Revelation is, is actually the culmination of all of the other prophecies in the Bible, because all of the symbolism that is used by other prophets is drawn into this book in very condensed form, and it's all put together in the one book. As if to say all of these prophecies that was delivered through all of these symbols is culminates in the things that are recorded in the apocalypse, in the book of Revelation. So, the book of Revelation uh, originally was written down uh, late in the first century, originally for a group of churches in Asia Minor, what then was known as Asia Minor, which is basically Turkey. And these uh, mainly seven churches were concentrated in the west coast of present day Turkey. And these churches were growing, they were going well, but they were in the midst of a hostile empire. In fact, an empire where the fastest growing religion at that time actually was emperor worship because it was enforced. And this was a big issue for Christians because they declared Jesus as Lord. And so the imperative to, emperor, to, to worship the emperor became a problem. It drew enormous persecution. The church at this time was going through waves of persecution and would continue to go through terrible, terrible persecution where terrible things were done. These churches suffered for their faith like you and I cannot imagine. And they are wondering, what is God doing here? This doesn't look like victory. It looks like we're losing the battle here. So how is this going to work out? And the book of Revelation is written to these embattled churches in Asia Minor, in the midst of persecution. And God is showing them exactly how the victory is going to be won. That's the book, what the book of Revelation is about. Well, given the complexity of the visions uh, in this book, it'd be very easy for me to get bogged down uh, today with lots of endless academic questions. But I want to highlight tonight the practical message of this book. The book of Revelation basically is showing us what God is doing and what our role in that is. Simplistically, that's what the book of Revelation is showing. us. Here is what God is doing, big picture, draw the curtain aside, and here is our role in all of that. That's very important. There's something great unfolding around us, even over above us. There is a spiritual realm. There is more to the world than what we see and hear. 
There is what Paul refers to uh, principalities and powers of a spiritual world that merges with the world that we see and hear and affects our world. And there is a spiritual battle at stake. There is a big picture. Most people intuitively, I think, sense that there is more to life than just what we see in here. There is an intuitive connection that we as human beings have with this, have with this dimension. And so human beings down through history have given that lots of interpretations. But what the book of Revelation does is that it highlights that it's peeling back the veil to show us exactly the sort of thing without telling us too much, understanding that these really are inexpressible things, but it's pulling back the veil to give us the big picture, showing us exactly what is going on behind the scenes. And that makes it a pretty amazing book, actually. It potentially makes it a very impacting book. So, the most important aspect, though, of the message of Book of Revelation, as I said, is the role that we have to play in this. Uh, we have a critical role to play in this. And one of the things that I think is great about working through the whole Bible in a, in a relatively short period of time is I get to connect the end with the beginning. Now, uh, cast your minds back to a message I preached on Genesis chapter one. And I, look, I know that you all memorized everything that I said, which is great. Because I, I made the point then God, that God created mankind to be in charge in the world. God empowered mankind. Said, this, I'm putting you in charge in this world. And when God empowers, he doesn't disempower. It says in Romans 11:29, the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. In other words, when God calls us and puts us in a position of responsibility, he doesn't then undercut that. He doesn't say, oh, you messed it up, even if we do mess it up, and we did mess it up and cast the world into chaos. He doesn't then say, oh, whoops, I'll take that responsibility away from us. No, it's always been our responsibility. And so if God wants to do something in the world, he is committed to doing it through us. Do you understand that? That's a really, really important theological fact that lies and over and explains a lot of things that are going to happen in the book of Revelation. So I want you to keep that in mind. Well, the book begins with an initial vision of Christ arrayed in glory. It's an uh, incredible vision in the first chapter who dictates seven letters to the churches of Asia Minor. These are letters uh, of, they provide words of reproof, words of commendation, basically what these letters are doing. I'm not going to go into the letters. Basically, Jesus is saying here to these churches, listen, guys, we need to batten down the hatches because think, th you think things are rough now. Things are going to get even rougher. And we need to batten down the hatches. So he, so he speaks to these churches and he said, these things that you're doing, keep doing those things. Don't give up doing those things. But listen, you need to look out for these areas. You need to take care of these things. Otherwise, it's going to be the death of you. And it says, do that, and I'm about to show you why. And the rest of Revelation explains why it was necessary for quite strong words to be spoken in those seven letters. Now, the actual revelation part begins in chapter four. Here, John is caught up in a vision. This has happened before. We've happened to Daniel, happened to Ezekiel, where they were given a vision of heaven. Well, John has this vision of heaven, and he sees in rich symbology, rich symbolism, he sees God being worshipped. Everything here is a symbol of something because... The reality is inexpressible. So let's have a look then at Revelation chapter five and you'll, you can follow this on the screen. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? Now what's the scroll? The scroll is the plan of God. It's God's plan to make the world right, to bring redemption and also to bring final justice in the world, final judgment. That's the scroll, basically. It's God's plan. And remember, when it comes to the world, 
It's God's plan, but it's our responsibility. Hence the question, who is worthy to, as it were, implement this plan in the scroll? Because it's our job to implement, but who is worthy? Is there anyone in the world who can do this? And it says here in verse three, but no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or even look inside it. As Paul says in Romans chapter three, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No one is worthy. We have all abdicated our position of responsibility and therefore we have all abdicated the authority that God originally intended. So no one was worthy to open the scroll. But then it says in verse five, but then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. In other words, only Jesus Christ is able to implement this plan. Why? Well, when John looks, he hears about the line of the tribe of Judah. And when he looks, he sees why. He sees why. Now, this is interesting because he hears about the line of the tribe of Judah. And a lion is a symbol of strength. It's a, it's a symbol of grandeur. It's a symbol of royalty. But when he looks to see the lion, what does he see? It says, then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He sees a lamb slain. You see, he's looking for an expression of power and of grandeur. And to his shock, when he looks for the lion, he sees a lamb slain. Now, what sort of victory is this? What sort of power is this? Well, it's not worldly power. And it's not a worldly kind of victory. And this is really important because this sets the tone for the rest of the book of Revelation. This sets the tone for the kind of victory that is gonna be described and portrayed. Not a worldly victory, not worldly grandeur, but a different kind of power that is gained through sacrifice. He sees a lamb. And it goes on, it says this, the lamb had seven horns and seven eyes. This is where we get into some of the weird bits. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all of the earth. Now this is a way, seven is a symbolic number indicating completeness. So this is a way of referring to the complete work of the Holy Spirit. That's all I'll say about that. Otherwise, honestly, if I get bogged down, be here all night. He went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So only Jesus Christ is able to implement this plan because he's the one that makes it possible. He purchased the redemption of mankind by becoming the sacrificial lamb for human beings. He stood in for mankind. He took the penalty in our place and exhausted the just penalty for our guilt by his death. This enables mankind to be restored from a position of guilt, allows mankind to be restored to his position of authority, you see, and therefore allows him to fulfill his responsibility. And as we shall see, and this is interesting, later on we're gonna see that the scroll or a form of the scroll is handed over to John. In other words, through Jesus Christ represents humankind and ultimately the scroll is given over to us. Why? Because it's our job to implement this plan. So let's then note verse eight here. It says, and when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Now the four living creatures represent all of creation. They represent the best of creation. The 24 elders represent the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles respectively, 24 elders. And they fell down before the lamb, representing God's people, representing all of creation. Each one had a harp and they were holding, and I want you to note this bit because this is really important. 
What were they holding? They were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. This is the bit that we read over in all the details, all the strangeness. These are the bits that we miss, and these are the bits that I want to draw your attention to. Because you see, everything, everything that follows in the book of Revelation is the answer to these prayers. It's the answer to these prayers. If we want something to happen in the world, because we're in charge here, we need to ask. Because God doesn't undercut us. God does nothing except through prayer. If we want things to happen here, we need to ask God and draw down on the power of God. So everything that happens and unfolds in terms of the unfolding of the scroll is going to happen in answer to prayer. Are you with me with that? Actually, are you with me in general? Good. I'm glad. Because we've got a fair uh, way to go yet. Good. Now, what we see, as I said from here on, God's answer to these prayers, these are militant prayers. I, this is one of the things about the book of Revelation. It's so difficult for us to put ourselves in this situation because we are almost, I would say, dangerously comfortable. We belong to a tiny percentage of the population in the world that experience unusual comfort, right? But the, these Christians were embattled. They were experienced. They were at the cold face of experiencing the evils and the injustices of this world. And they were crying out to God. This was the nature of their prayers. Crying out, saying, God, when are you going to finally demolish all evil? When are you going to make things right? And God says, oh, I'm going to do that. I will do it. And I will do it in answer to your prayers. So what unfolds here then is a series of, of sevens. Now, seven is important. We're going to see seven seals. We're going to see seven trumpets. We're going to see seven bowls. Now, seven again is important because it's the number of completeness. So this is complete, the completion of God's plan. Incidentally, if I may add a footnote here, which I will. Incidentally, wherever you have the number three and a half means Incomplete means limited. It's a symbol of limited, something being limited. And it often refers to God allowing certain evils to take place, but he only allows it for three and a half years. And often it's even expressed in months. Only for 42 months will this happen. In other words, it's half a seven, so it's limited by God. You understand? And often it's even expressed in days. One, you know, this is going to happen for 1,200 and I can't remember. I mean, whatever, you know, it is in days. In other words, it's saying, no, the days are numbered for those who do evil in the earth. You understand that? This is, where, this is where all of these numbers are important uh, in their symbolism. So, first of all, the seven seals are broken. And with each one, a judgment is unleashed on a quarter of the earth. Now, there are these, in each case, judgments are unleashed. This is God shaking the world, right? And the reason he's shaking the world is to polarize things. He wants let black be black, let white be white, and I'm going to shake the world more and more and more to polarise things so that God's people will shine as God's people and those who don't really want, really want to follow Jesus, then they will fall away. He's sorting out the wheat from the weeds, as it were, you see. As it, this is the role of these judgments. Uh, to, bring, to have this polarizing effect. So the first uh, wave of judgments is these seven seals. Now the first four seals, and we can follow these uh, on, the, on the screen, the first four of the seven seals trigger the, the famous four horsemen of the apocalypse, representing here ambition for conquest, war, famine, and death. Now, you can see how those things flow from one another. You know, ambition for conquest leads to violence and war, leads to famine, leads to death. This is basically uh, God's judgment through world history. The first thing that God does, actually, in the world and in our lives is to bring evil to the surface. If it's there, he'll bring it to the surface so that we will see it, recognize it, and go to God and pray and cry out and say, God, we need help here. 
And so surely enough, what do we find in the fifth seal? The prayers of God's people. In response to all of the evils in the world that God has allowed to come to the surface, we find people crying out to God. And as I said, everything that follows on from this is answer to these prayers. Nothing happens except in answer to prayer. So the final seal then uh, unleashes, uh, sorry, the sixth seal, I should say, unleashes cosmic upheaval, which brings us right to the very end. So each of these waves of judgment brings us right up to the very end. Okay, now at this point in chapter seven, there's an interlude in which God's people are sealed or marked in preparation for the judgment of the seven trumpets. So the seventh seal makes way for the seventh or consists in seven trumpets. But before that happens, God's people are marked. This is what it says. Then I saw another angel coming from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Now, where else in the Bible do we see God's people being marked or their households being marked so that judgment when it comes will, and I'm gonna give it away, pass over. Exodus, thank you. Uh, you all cried that out enthusiastically. That's fantastic, you're with me. Okay, book of Exodus. Now, there are lots of allusions here to the book of Exodus. This is all, the whole journey of the apocalypse is an Exodus kind of thing, okay? We're gonna see allusions to this uh, throughout here. So this is Exodus imagery. God's people are marked. And this, again, is in response to the prayers of God's people, as it was with the Israelites in their slavery. They cried out and God heard their cries and he, he answered them. So, John, Here's the number of those, seated, of those sealed on earth before the judgment. And it's 144,000. This is a symbolic number. Uh, it's actually even divided up into groups of 12,000. And this looks very much like military formation. This is the significance of this. This looks like military formation. 12 indicating the complete people of God. 12 is an important number because of the 12 tribes of Israel. So the complete people of God ready for battle. You see, that's what, that's what happens here. So he hears the number, but when he looks, he sees a numberless multitude, a multitude that he cannot number uh, at least. So we're now ready for the seventh seal. When the seventh seal is broken, this is in chapter eight, it says that there was silence in heaven for half an hour. Now why would there be silence in heaven for half an hour? What's happening here is that heaven is silent as it becomes clear from the next few verses. Heaven is silent most probably listening and hearing the prayers of God's people. Heaven is listening. Heaven is absorbing the prayers of God's people. Isn't that amazing? Heaven is silent. When you pray, there is silence. Listen, listen. He's praying. And then we see what follows. It says here, Another angel, this is uh, verse three, another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer. What does this mean? The incense was used in the temple and it symbolized, you've got it, the prayers of God's people. So it says here, he, had much, he was given much incense to offer, much incense with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of God's people went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, get this imagery, this is beautiful imagery. The angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar and he hurled it down upon the earth and there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning and an earthquake. 
In other words, the power of God, these are symbols of the power of God to defeat evil was poured down as the prayers went up, the power of God came down. As the prayers went up, the power of God came down. You got it? This is what's happening here. This is how evil is defeated. We see this in that these prayers then activate the seven trumpet blasts. And we see again this depicted on the screen. This is God's response to the prayers of his people. With each trumpet blast, a judgment is unleashed on a third of the earth. And this is the interesting thing with these three waves of sevens of judgments. The seven seals, judgment on a quarter of the earth. The seven trumpets, judgments upon a third of the earth. And then the seven bowls are going to be judgment upon the whole of the earth. So there's an intensification as we move up towards the end. So on a third of the earth. Now I'm not going to go uh, into these judgments. Suffice it to say that these mirror the ten plagues on Egypt in the book of Exodus. And with exactly the same purpose. They're the same kinds of things that happen in these cases. It's the same sorts of things. They allude to this same reason, to polarise the situation, you see. To make it evident who are God's people and who are not God's people. To make evident the decisions that people have. To polarise, to show black from white. This is an act of judgement. This is what God does. This is what we see here. This is the seven trumpet blasts. Now after the sixth trumpet, there's another interlude in chapter 10, which again focuses on God's people and their place in all this. I hope you're getting the idea here. John is, this is what it says. I'll read it to you. Then a voice, then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me once more. Go and take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. See, the scroll is given now to John. John here stands for us. Who is worthy to open the scroll? It seems now we all are because of what Jesus has done. So the scroll is given to us. But here's the interesting thing. Listen to what it says next. He says, so I went to the angel and I asked him, to give me the little scroll. It wasn't automatically given to him. He went and he asked the angel. He said, yep, I will take responsibility. I am willing to step in and play my role. I'm willing, so yes, give me the scroll. Isn't that amazing? Yet again, there's an act of prayer here. A decision that is made to step in and be a part of what God's doing. So he said to me, take it and eat it. Now, who else in the Bible was given a scroll to eat? Can anyone tell me? Ezekiel, thank you. Ezekiel. And Ezekiel was handed a scroll, in very similar to this, and he was told to eat it. In other words, imbibe what I say. Become the message. I'm going to make you a prophet to the nations. This is what God said to Ezekiel, this is what God is saying to John. I'm going to make you a prophet to the nation. So eat the scroll, imbibe it, become the truth, and then you will be able to be a mouthpiece of God, a light in the darkness. Eat the scroll, he says. But he says, but in your mouth it will be as sweet. It, sorry, it, he says, it will turn your stomach sour because these are some heavy things about the things that God is going to have to do. And yet it was sweet as honey. Why? Because ultimately it was the plan of God to make things right. Then I, uh, I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and I ate it, tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. So John represents here us. And the next chapter is interesting because again, for all its complexity, and probably the most complex chapter in the book of Revelation is chapter 11. And again, I'm not going to get bogged down in this. Simply to say uh, that it's speaking about our role in all of this. Chapter 11 describes the ministry of two witnesses, which may be real people 
or a symbol of God's people as a whole or even both. Read it for yourself, decide for yourself, uh, go to town. But the main point here is that God is giving people the authority to implement his plan. So finally, the seventh trumpet, the last trumpet sounds, you know, Paul talks about the last trumpet blast. Well, here we come to the last trumpet blast. And this is going to activate the final judgments and the final defeat of evil. So at this point, we zoom in and we're given a bizarre set of visions <laughs> depicting the defeat of Satan. This is the vision of the woman, the child, and the famous red dragon in chapter 12. Now, I'm not going to get into the details again. Suffice it to say that Satan is cast down, but he's enabled to make one last attempt. It seems to destroy God's people, to mislead the people of the world. And you think, why is God doing this? Why is God allowing the dragon, as it were, to have this kind of power and do these sorts of things? Why? Because it sorts the wheat from the weeds. It polarises things. It shows up who people really are and it also then is going to show God's power and glory in defeating and overthrowing the dragon. So then we come to the famous chapter about the two beasts, the beasts who come up, the beast that comes up from the sea and the beast from the land. Interestingly, uh, about these beasts, in every way, the beasts try to mimic Jesus and the church. You can read uh, chapter 13 uh, for yourself and spin yourself out tonight. Uh, they mimic Jesus. They stage a resurrection. They put their mark on their own people, the mark of the beast. The significance of the mark of the beast is copying, in a sense, what God has just done. He's marked his people, and now the beast, the beast marks his people. You see, polarizing situation. And then also they do miracles and signs and wonders. But most importantly, and this is the interesting thing about this, they are given the authority to make war on God's people, not only to make war on God's people, but to actually conquer them. This is what we see here. It says this, the beast was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. You're thinking, oh my goodness, we've lost. You know, stop there, we've lost. And yet the strange thing about this is that having said this and describing what looks to be defeat, the scene switches to heaven and everyone's celebrating. Yay! Yay, we won the victory. You're thinking, what on earth is going on here? That does not look like victory. They just all got killed. They got defeated. The beasts win all of the power on the authority. On earth. I mean, this, sorry, where, where, how is that a victory? Good question. Oh, it's a victory. Absolutely, it's a victory. Because the scene switches to heaven and they are celebrating in the heavenly realms. But we need to think about what sort of victory is this? Now I'm going to talk about that in a moment, but let me quickly tie this off before I do. This victory is then announced and it's seen unfolding on earth at the last trumpet blast, which ushers in the final seven, okay? Look, one more seven. Are you all right? One more seven, we're up to the third seven. And I'm just gonna to allude to this very briefly. Now the seven bowls of judgment are then poured out upon the whole earth, a quarter, a third, a whole. This is the final and most intense round, again designed to polarize things, to either turn people away from God or to turn people to God, but nothing in between, no sitting on the fence. God doesn't want that. You either, either go that way or that way, but for goodness sake, make up your mind. And I'm going to shake the world to force you to make up your mind. Maybe God's going to do this in your life. Maybe he's going to do it soon. He's going to shake up your world so that you either choose to go that way or you go that way. He's not going to have it in between. It's not only what God has done, it's what God does, what he's going to continue to do. It's going to intensify moving up to the end. Well, this culminates in the final drawing out of the, all of the evil forces of the world at the famous Battle of Armageddon where they are finally overthrown. They are overthrown by the rider on the white horse, the return of Jesus Christ, who returns in glory and with the sword that comes out of his mouth. Think about the symbolism. He defeats 
Satan, the dragon, the beast, decisively. Then he ushers in the final judgment and a new heavens and a new earth. And I'm going to talk about that part uh, a little bit more, uh, a lot more, actually, next week. Right now, I want to focus on really a central point that I've been bringing uh, out of this letter. So just give me another five minutes. Are you still with me? Good. Now, listen, what sort of victory is this, really? How did they win? Well, it's not a military victory. The beast wins the military victory. It says clearly here, it was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. Now, look, it's not a political victory either. Because it says here, and the beast was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. Okay, there's not much room there either for a political kind. So what kind of victory is this? Oh, it's a much better victory than that. See, because military might, politics, it's not going to change anything. Never has, and it never, ever will. But God is going to change things completely. And this is how the victory is won. Revelation chapter 12 says this. Now have come the salvation and power and the kingdom of our God. It's happened. And the authority of his Messiah. For, and I want you to note this, the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. So I want you to notice what happen, is happening here. Why does Satan accuse us? You know, he's known throughout Scripture as the accuser. Why does he do that? Is, is, he, is he doing that just because he's a real mean guy? No, listen, he does that because he's keeping us down because if we step as human beings, if we step into our position of authority and if we take responsibility, his work is finished. So he drags us down. He says, oh, no, no. He's not worthy to open the scroll. See, he doesn't want the scroll, you see. The scroll is God making things right. The scroll is the defeat of evil. No, no, he's not worthy to open the scroll. No, no, she's, oh, she's not worthy to open the scroll. No, you know what it feels like, don't you? Where you sense God is calling you to step up into something, but you think, oh, I just, I, 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 just, I just feel like hope, I'm hopeless. I keep failing, I'm, I'm not worthy. Yeah, God knows. He knows that you're hopeless. But he's giving you hope. He's given you hope. And this is what it says. He's been hurled down. The one who accuses you has been hurled down and he's taken his accusations with him. This is what it says. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb, and by the word of their testimony, they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. See, they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb because through the death of Jesus Christ, we are restored to our position of authority. And when we are restored to our position of authority, then the words that we speak, they matter, you see. Now, here's how this works. The door is open. This is what this is saying. The door's open. You can step back up into a, position of response, into a position of authority, but here's the key. In order for you to receive the authority to change the environments that you are in, which is your calling, because you're responsible, and we don't, you know, responsibility is something we naturally say, oh, I'm, I, I'm not, not responsible for that. No, no, you are. You are, and if you choose to be, if you say about the context in which you find yourself, you know what? I'm going to take responsibility for this. I'm going to take responsibility. And I'm going to pray and I'm going to do everything I can to see change in people's lives around, to see change in the environment. Listen, you, you take responsibility. And let me tell you, authority will follow. As you step up into that position of responsibility, authority will follow you. This is exactly what I said right at the start of this series. God is looking for a people today, folks, who are willing, who are willing to step up and take responsibility. 
who are willing to draw down on the power of God, who are willing to change things. See, our prayers often tend to go like this. Lord, give us today our daily bread. Lord, also give us today our daily bread. Oh, and give us today our daily bread. You see, that's how our prayers go. It's like all me, oh, Lord, help me, help me do this, help me do... Whoa, 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 wait a second. Don't, don't get me wrong. God wants us to pray and He wants to supply our provision and our daily bread. He wants to give us things and provide into our lives. Oh, but there's something. You were built for something bigger than just survival. You were made to actually be an agent of change to be a guardian of the order of God and the will of God in this world. That's our job, if we will take responsibility. And God calls us to say, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And to look at situations and say, God, we need change here and to draw down the power of God into that situation. And listen, if you do that, get ready to see change. Because you are praying what Paul calls in Ephesians chapter six, you are praying in the spirit. You see, you you are putting your prayers into the, the jet stream of God's purpose and get ready because your life is gonna be a matter of prayer, fulfillment, prayer, fulfillment. Because nothing happens except through prayer. I have heard the situation described like, unfortunately described like this. A question is often asked, you know, why do we need to pray? Uh, Why do we need to serve God? Why can't just God do it, you see? And I've heard it described like this. Well, it's like, you know, little Johnny. He wants to join dad who's building, you know, he's building a house. And dad's got the hammer and the saw and dad's doing his thing. And little Johnny comes along and he comes along with his plastic hammer. And his plastic saw, you know. Oh, and isn't he cute, right? You know, he's really cute. And he joins dad and dad hasn't, you know. Look, that's not, that's not what it's like. That's not why. It's not just so that we can be a part of what God is doing. No, it's because it's our job. It's actually our job. God wants to give us the real hammer and the saw. And unfortunately, unfortunately, for a lot of us, All we do have is a plastic hammer and a plastic saw. And you know why? Because you haven't stepped up and really taken responsibility. There's a different kind of prayer that occurs when you really in your heart, you respond to God and you say, God, in Jesus' name, as a representative, I'm gonna represent Jesus. I'm going to receive the scroll. When you are willing to say, I'll take this, give me the scroll. Yes, I will receive the scroll. I will take responsibility. Listen, when you do that, and when you step up into your position of responsibility, then God will give you authority and you'll get a real hammer and a real saw and you will really change things. You understand? You will really change things. And God is raising up a people who are going to really change things. And you can be that person. And your life can be prayer, fulfillment, prayer, fulfillment, prayer, fulfillment. And you're going to stand as part of a multitude on that day. And you're going to celebrate. Because this, all of the wonderful things that we see God giving to his people are given to those who are victorious. This is what it says. And we see it on this center screen right here. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne to the one who's victorious. We have a tremendous opportunity. I believe that God is increasingly in our midst going to begin to polarize things. I believe God's going to do things in your life that are going to begin to make things very clear. He may bring out the worst before he brings out the best. Maybe God's gonna shake you up and you're gonna have to make a clear decision about what sort of life you wanna lead. This is serious, folks. 
eternal issues at stake here. Please decide now what sort of life you're going to lead. Please stand. Tonight, we're going to celebrate the blood of the Lamb that is spoken about in the book of Revelation, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We're going to take the elements, symbols, talk about symbols. This is what we're going to celebrate with you. We're going to take the cup that represents the shed blood of Jesus. We're going to take the bread that represents the broken body of Jesus. And this is actually not just about reflecting vaguely on what Jesus has done. These are the symbols that Jesus gave us to actually seal the agreement between He and us. This is how we say, yes, I will take the scroll. This is how we say, yes, I will step up into this responsibility. Yes, I will go through the door that Jesus has opened. If that's you tonight, I want you to make a decision. I want you to come forward. I want you to take a little bit of bread. I want you to take that cup. I want you to eat and drink. But listen, look out. Because God's going to hold you to that. He's going to hold you to it. Maybe you don't feel like you can do this tonight. Maybe you need to think about it. That's fine. You don't have to do this. But if tonight you want to respond and say, yes, yes, I will take the scroll. Then you come forward and you take that bread and that cup and you say yes tonight. All right? Come and do this in your own time while the music team is playing.